it is already time to do my February mid-month wrap-up. Let's jump in. Hello, beautiful friends. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to the Continuing Chronicles. It is time for me to wrap up what I've read in February so far. I have completed four books, DNF'd one, and I'm in the middle of two. So of course I will go into my thoughts about the four that I finished and the one that I've DNF'd, and then hopefully the other two will make it into my final February wrap up. Now, normally I just talk about these books in the order that I read them. However, I want to go ahead and start with my DNF because I literally just DNF'd it like 30 minutes ago. In fact, I wasn't even going to film this wrap up until tomorrow because I didn't think I was going to finish the book until today or tomorrow but I just couldn't handle it anymore so I DNF'd it and the thoughts are so fresh in my mind I was like you know what I'm gonna sit down I'm gonna film I'm gonna rant because it needs to be discussed so the book that I did DNF is From Here to You by Jamie McGuire and y'all this shocked me to death. I could not believe that I was DNFing this because this was probably one of the books that I was the most excited about from my February TBR, but I got about halfway through and I just could not handle it. So let's discuss. This book follows two main characters. Darby Dixon, at the very beginning of this book, she is sitting in the bathroom of a Texas church. She is about to marry her douchebag of a fiance, but she's holding a pregnancy test and she is pregnant. And she realizes that she cannot go through with this wedding. Her fiance is abusive. He is not a good man. And while she normally wouldn't really care about her herself she does care about her child so she decides to flee in her wedding dress and everything and she just takes the next bus that she can get on basically and she lands in Colorado Springs Colorado there and within a couple of days she ends up finding a job as a front desk clerk at a local hotel the other main character in this is Scott Trex Trexler he is a former marine he is a former FBI agent and now he is currently a private security contractor who has landed like this really prestigious top secret job in Colorado and he is staying at the hotel until he can basically get his own place so the way that this is pitched you're thinking that you're going to go into this with two very kind of scarred and troubled people. Darby is obviously running away from a very toxic relationship. She wants to just keep her head down. She doesn't want her former fiance to be able to find her. She wants to just be able to support herself and her baby. And the last thing she wants is to be in a relationship. And then you have Scott and you're thinking, okay, so he's a former Marine. He's seen some shit. He has some PTSD. He was a former FBI agent. So he's been through a lot. He's been to some of the most war-torn places in the country. He obviously is going to have some issues. And so the way that I thought this was going to go was that you have these two very troubled people who are both running from something, who both have secrets, who are both very, very guarded. And even though they obviously have an attraction to each other, they're going to slowly build that and it is going to turn into something more. Meanwhile, their secrets catch up to them and Darby's husband is on the warpath to find her and so on. That's what I thought this was going to be. That is not what I got. First of all, let me get my most superficial complaint out of the way because this is a complaint that is solely reserved for the audiobook. The narrator made Darby sound way younger than I think she was supposed to be. Her age is never directly mentioned in here in the part that I read, but I'm assuming she's probably supposed to be about mid 20s and of course she's from Texas so she does have that southern twang which I felt the narrator did well but she made Darby sound like she was 18 years old. I could not get past that because the way that she portrayed Darby, Darby sounded like a young stupid naive teenager and I couldn't get past that because Trex in here is I think mid-30s. I think they said he was about 35 years old. So that's my first gripe of course that was a that's a me thing and an audiobook thing. That's not a really a book problem. So let's go ahead and get into the book problems. There were so many superfluous side characters in here that were not pertinent to the story at all at least from what I could see from the very first half of this book. There were so many characters mentioned and a lot of them you can tell were previously in other books. Like there were some of the Maddox brothers in here. I read Beautiful Disaster almost 10 years ago now and one of the main characters was a Maddox. So there were some Maddox characters in here and you could tell they and Trex had had a previous interaction. So even though they weren't important to the story and you definitely don't have to read those other books to understand this, you know as a reader that you are missing something, especially since they are actually more prominent than you think that they would be. And that happens multiple times. There are multiple characters in here you know that you would have probably met in previous books, but not in here. And I didn't understand that because they were not important to the story at all as far as I could tell. So I'm not sure why we were made to remember these characters or care about them in any way, shape or form. And you know what else seemed to make no sense and didn't seem to be pertinent to this overall story was the side plot of Trex and his super secret top secret job. Because one of the whole reasons he's in Colorado Springs is he's becoming like the head of this private security thing at this government defense contract in Colorado Springs. And that's all fine and dandy. But then you get to the point where he's starting this job and you realize that his whole job is a sham and I'm not really going to go into it but you realize that him and the team that he has formed are basically there for the most ridiculous reasons ever. It was totally unbelievable that this would actually happen. Not only was that so stupid but it makes you wonder why it was even put in the book in the first place. Like why are we showing Trex 
go to his job? Why are we showing Trex interacting with these? Why are we showing any of this when it has no bearing on the plot at all, except that because of his job, Trex is lying to Darby. And I'm going to get there in a second. But first, I want to talk about one of the most extreme cases of insta-love I have ever come across in a book. So to recap, Darby is on the run from a toxic abusive fiance. She is pregnant. She obviously has some baggage and she is now mistrustful of anybody from the military, law enforcement, any kind of position of authority whatsoever. She refuses to even look their way and she's currently surrounded in a hotel by a bunch of firefighters who were there in Colorado Springs to battle a lot of massive wildfires. So that they're called hotheads in this book. So she is surrounded by all of these firefighters. And even though apparently she's like the most beautiful thing on the planet, she's a former beauty pageant winner and everybody's all over her and ogling her and telling her how beautiful she is. She's not even giving them a second glance. So in her head, in her inner monologue, you're hearing her saying, no, I don't want these guys. The last thing I need is a relationship. I need some time for myself. I need to get strong. I need to be there for my baby. That should be my focus. And then enters Trex. And at first, you know, for like the first couple of days, you can see her fight this. Obviously she's attracted to him and she's fighting and she's like, no way. I, I don't have time for this. I cannot possibly be in a relationship. That's the last thing that I need. But then it doesn't really take long for her to lower her defenses. And then let's talk about Trex because as soon as he saw Darby, the moment that he saw Darby, it was love for him. He loved her and he knew that she was the one. Yes, the one. And that is even mentioned in here. I guess Trex has always had this idea in his mind of the one and that he was going to know when he found the one. And because of this, because he's been basically in love with a woman he's never met his entire life that has affected every single other romantic relationship that he's had. But as soon as he sees her, he knows. Like he is for sure that he wants this girl and that this is his soulmate, even though he's he doesn't know her at all. He doesn't know anything about her past. And then he does find out that she's pregnant and he's like, all right, you know, no big deal. I'll be this baby's daddy. Like it was insane the amount of insta-love that was in here. I couldn't believe it. I was thinking that this was gonna be two walled off people who had to kind of slowly break down their defenses because they've both been through some crap. That's not what this was. Scott was instantly in love with her. A love at first sight thing and he basically admits it in here. And so let's go ahead and get back to the lying part. There is deception here. There's deception here because Trex won't tell Darby about his job. First of all, because he says he can't because it's top secret, but also he knows how she feels about like former military, law enforcement, all that stuff. So he makes her believe that he is one of the hotheads. He is one of the firemen up there battling the wildfires. And then when it comes out, and this is right around when I DNF and you'll find out why. When it comes out, he tells her the truth, kind of. He never mentions that he's a former Marine. Like, I don't know if that's intentional. He tells her that he's former FBI and that he can't really talk about his current job. And she's starting to doubt that she can trust him in that same page basically. When he's concerned that he has lost her forever, she starts taking off her clothes. And of course, they get it on. And then he tells her he loves her. Now, I want you to keep in mind for a second, y'all, that this is happening over the span of maybe a week or two. She just got this job at the hotel. She's still learning her job. Like, she's still actively being trained. She hasn't fully 100% learned the ropes yet. And all of a sudden, after telling herself she didn't want to be in a relationship, she needed to be strong on her own, and she doesn't even know if she can trust him now after everything that was revealed, she is having sex with him, and he tells her that he loves her. I stopped. I stopped. I put the book down right there there because I realized I was only halfway through and I could not deal. I could not deal being only halfway through this book, having all of this stuff happen and still having to read the rest of it. So I DNF'd this book and then I came right in here to rant. I cannot even believe how bad this was and how much of a hot mess and how all over the place everything was. Nothing was cohesive. Nothing made sense. So many characters and side plots were introduced in here that didn't seem to make any difference. Maybe they like all come together in the end. I don't know, but I could not make myself get there. I just couldn't do it. So this is a DNF. I will be unhauling this and I'm basically going to remove anything from Jamie McGuire from my to be read because I just, if this is the quality of her work now, I just can't. Since I went ahead and started with my least favorite, I'll just go ahead and continue in that direction. So my my next least favorite book that I read was Hour of the Assassin by Matthew Cork. This is basically like a high octane action packed kind of book. It's basically like you are reading an action movie. This is following Nick Everose. He is a former Secret Service agent and now he has his own business where basically tests security vulnerabilities. During his time with the Secret Service, he basically learned to think like an assassin because he was protecting some of the most powerful people in the country. And now people pay him to make sure that there really are no security vulnerabilities surrounding these powerful people. And so in this book, he is starting a new job. He is meant to kind of try to go after the former director of the CIA. But then when he gets there, the CIA director is actually murdered right in front of him. And he realizes that he is about to be framed for the CIA director's murder. So this is a really about him trying to clear his name, trying to figure out 
who is doing this, why they're doing it. And like I said, it's basically like reading an action movie. I think y'all probably know by now that this is really not my type of book. Do I enjoy watching action movies? Yes. But when I'm reading, I really don't want a fast paced, bam, bam, bam kind of book. I want something a little bit slower paced. I want to get to know the characters. I want that development. And this was not it. This was very short. This was very fast, compulsively readable. Yes. Was it like a fun experience? Sure. But in the end, I'm not going to ever remember anything about this book. In fact, I already don't. So it just really wasn't my style. It was just literally 100% plot based. It was meant to keep you turning the pages, go, go, go. And that's really not what I'm wanting in a book. So it was okay. Like I'm not mad that I read it. I'm glad that I gave it a chance, but I think as I'm learning more and more about my taste, I just need to avoid these in the future. So it is definitely going to get unhauled. It was really nothing spectacular. And I gave this a three stars. Next, I read The Familiar Dark by Amy Engel. This actually wasn't on my February TBR. This was very kindly sent to me by somebody in the No Shelf Control Facebook group. I had actually sent this book to her and on my gift note, I put how much I really loved Amy Engel's The Roanoke Girls. And so when I saw this, I wanted this person to have it because I wanted to see if she enjoyed it and she did. And so she kindly sent it to me, even though she didn't have to, I told her to keep it. And she was like, no, let me share the love. And she sent it to me. So I wanted to go ahead and read it. So this is basically following our main character, Eve Taggart. And in the beginning of this book, she finds out that her daughter, as well as her daughter's best friend, they are about 12 years old. Both of them have been murdered. It really is about Eve trying to find her daughter's killer. But really more than that, it's about Eve and how she grew up and her dysfunctional family. Eve was born, raised, and now currently lives and works in the very poorest part in the Missouri Ozarks. She and her brother were raised by a very, very hard mother, a mother who did not show love, a mother who like drank and did drugs and did all of this stuff. So she and her brother came from a very, very difficult background. And then Eve got pregnant after a one night stand and she kind of cleaned herself up a little bit, but she's still stuck in that same town. She's working at the same diner that she's worked for for the 12 years since she became a mom. And so she's just had a very hard life. And that's really what this is about because you're seeing her relationship with her brother. You're seeing her relationship with her mother and you're seeing her as she turns back into her former tough self as she tries to find her daughter's killer and all of the stuff that she's willing to do to get there. In typical Amy Engel style, this definitely has the dark and gritty feel that you become accustomed to with her. Amy Engel really is not afraid to go there in terms of the dark and disturbing subject matter. So I really appreciated that. And that's what really draws me to Amy Engel and her books. And overall, I thought that this was again, a very compulsively readable book. I didn't enjoy it as much as the Roanoke Girls. I didn't feel it had as much oomph as the Roanoke Girls. But what I can say about Amy Engel is that she lets her characters do what they need to do. And I appreciated that. And I liked watching Eve's journey. So I know that people who have read this had a problem with that because even though her daughter's murder is the catalyst for everything that you're reading in this book, it really is about Eve and her life and what she's been through. And even the atmosphere of this, the grittiness of this was like a character in the book. Amy Engel is great with atmosphere. So you could basically feel where you were. You could feel that desperation and the poverty and everything that went along with it. You could just see some of the characters in your head that she was describing because you've probably encountered some of them in your lifetime or seen them on TV. So Amy Engel is really a master about setting the scene and giving you fantastic atmosphere. So overall, I really did enjoy this book. I gave it a 3.5 star. So like I said, it wasn't the caliber of Roanoke, but it's definitely not something that I will forget. And I will absolutely pick up more from Amy Engel in the future. Y'all, if the lighting just changed for the better, that's because I only just now realized that my ring light wasn't on. I'm almost done with this video and I just now turned on my ring light, but there is no going back now because I just did my solid rant. So we're leaving it. The next book that I finished was The Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware. I believe I've now read everything by Ruth Ware with the exception of her most recent book. And I actually really, really enjoyed this. I think truly this is probably my most favorite Ruth Ware up until this point. So this follows our main character, Rowan. And at the very beginning of this book, she is in prison and she is currently writing to a solicitor she hopes that she can get to take her case because they are accusing her of killing one of the children in her charge. But she swears up and down that she didn't. And this story is her writing to her lawyer explaining what happened. And so basically what you find out is that Rowan was a child caregiver in a nursery and she sees an ad in a paper for a live-in nanny and it just seems too good to be true. It's at a beautiful house in the Scottish Highlands on a bunch of land and she's going to be paid exorbitantly well and she just thinks oh my gosh this is too amazing and she goes and she interviews and she gets the job and she of course finds out that some of the past nannies haven't really lasted very long. There's been talks about the house being haunted and things like that so they're basically desperate for a nanny and that is why they're offering her so much money. But Rowan thinks that it's silly. She has no idea why the other nannies left, but she knows that that's not going to be her. But she soon realizes that this job is not all that it's cut out to be. First of all, this is a smart house. And so everything literally is rigged by a touchpad. So you have to turn on the lights by the touchpad, open the curtains by the touchpad. And she's really unnerved by this, especially since there are cameras all over the house. Everything is monitored and it's just very invasive in her opinion. Not only that, but she's left alone with the children almost instantaneously. The parents take off. They're both architects. They have big projects going on. They need somebody desperately to watch their children. Rowan is just kind of fed to the wolves 
And on top of that, the children are very difficult and not as receptive to her as she hoped that they would be. So there's a lot of adjustment going on here, especially with the smart house and the children. She's just trying to survive and take care of the children. And soon she starts experiencing some of the same things some the other nannies had experienced. So this is about her and her journey, trying to figure out what is going on in this house. And then of course you find out at the end what actually happened to the little girl that was killed in her charge and so on. And like I said, I really enjoyed this. I thought it was really well done. And there was a twist in here that I didn't see coming. It wasn't a twist that really affected anything in terms of the plot. Like it didn't affect the outcome of the plot, but it was something that I didn't see coming at all. And I thought it was really clever. There was also a little smaller twist that I really didn't feel needed to be thrown in there. I didn't feel it did anything, but you know, hey, it is what it is. I didn't see that coming either. I really enjoyed the way this was told. I especially enjoyed the ending because even though you find out what happens, there's almost a lack of closure in some instances because you don't necessarily 100% know what happened to Rowan herself. So I ultimately really, really enjoyed this. Like I said, I think this is probably my favorite Ruth wear to date. And I did give this a four out of five stars. And then my most favorite book of February so far, one that was such a lovely surprise was Rescue You by Alicia Whistler. This was one of the first books that I received as part of the book drop subscription and I was so pleasantly surprised by this. I admit I was a little bit intimidated by it because I know that a big portion of the plot of this surrounds dogs and dog rescue and I was so concerned that I wasn't going to be able to handle it because animals are a trigger of mine. Like I don't want to see a dog die in a book. Kill humans all day every day but not a dog. So I was really really concerned but luckily overall this really didn't have too too much of that. I actually found this book to be very multi-layered and because of that I'm struggling a little bit to figure out how to explain it. So I think what I want to do instead of like summarizing the plot, I want to kind of summarize the characters because I feel like it'll give you a holistic idea of everything that happened in here because there really were a lot of things going on. So this follows three main characters. The first is Sunny and she is the one that owns the dog rescue called Pity Place and she's basically dedicated her whole life to giving a home to unwanted dogs. That is her life and that is her mission. I actually found Sunny pretty relatable because Sunny is willing to go above the law to rescue dogs. They actually live near a puppy mill and the owner of the puppy mill is awful and she knows that those dogs are being abused. So she will break in and steal dogs that she knows are being abused. And I can definitely relate to that because I've gone to some illegal lengths to save animals in the past. So I can definitely relate to that. But Pity Place is Sunny's whole life and she's dedicated to rescuing these dogs. Sunny often finds herself going toe to toe with the owner of the puppy mill because the puppy mill owner knows that Sunny sometimes takes her dog. One day Sunny successfully gets the dog mill shut down and the owner comes and threatens her and starts to take action against the rescue and so you're following that journey as well. You're also following Sunny's developing relationship with a very longtime childhood friend of hers who actually helps dogs and trains them for wounded veterans. So that is a big part of this as well. Perhaps I would say the main, main character is Constance. Constance is Sunny's sister and Sunny and Constance actually lost their dad about a year ago from cancer. It was a long, hard fight and Constance found herself to be the main caregiver for her father. And then shortly after that, she ended the relationship with her longtime fiance after she found him kind of cheating on her. So she's had a very, very difficult year and she's pretty much lost herself. She's kind of in a rut. She used to be very active. She used to love running. She used to run all of the time. She hasn't run in a very long time by this point. Point. And really the only thing keeping her going is her job as a massage therapist. She has her own little business as a masseuse, but she also massages Sunny's dogs, kind of like helps them because she knows that a lot of them are traumatized. So she massages them and everything like that. So that's really what keeps her going. Then on a whim one day, she decides to walk into Semper Fit, which is a local gym. And she immediately starts taking part in a workout that's going on, a very, very challenging workout. And she finds herself very vindicated after completing the workout and she wants to do more. So she continues to go back there and it sounds like it's kind of CrossFit. And at the this gym as she meets Rhett Santos who is actually the owner of the gym. And that brings us to Rhett Santos, who is a former Marine. And again, he is the owner of Semper Fit. He definitely has seen a lot. He did about five tours in the Middle East. So he has gone through a lot. He has PTSD and Semper Fit is kind of his refuge where he sweats out his issues and he lets others do the same. And he was actually injured in the line of duty during one of his tours. So he kind of has a really bad leg. He has a lot of pain all the time. Then he meets Constance and he really admires her tenacity because here's this woman who comes and joins a workout she's never been a part of. It's extremely tough, but she refuses to give up. So he really admires her for that and he finds her very spunky and he wasn't expecting to be kind of knocked off guard by her. So they kind of develop this friendship. Rhett helps train her and push her to her physical limits, making her do things she never thought she could do. And then Constance helps by massaging his leg, kind of like making him feel better and relieving him from pain. And so you're watching their developing relationship as well throughout all of this. So this has so many different facets. You're following the sister dynamics between Sunny and Constance who have a close relationship. Constance obviously helps Sunny run her dog rescue and they also have issues from their past. They lost their mom when they were very young 
young Constance practically raised Sonny. Their dad was a bit distant. He was a Vietnam veteran who lost his hearing so he could only communicate in sign language and only Constance knew sign language. So there was a disconnect between Sonny and her dad so she never had the relationship with him that Constance did. So there's like no animosity there but there is definitely some issues that they've had to work through and of course Constance did care for their dad while they were battling cancer. So you have all of that, that family dynamic. And then of course you have multiple romances going on here. You have Sunny developing the relationship with Pete. And again, Pete actually trains rescue dogs to be service animals to wounded vets, which I found very fantastic. So obviously the military is very heavily featured and respected in this book, which I adored. Pet rescue is heavily featured in here as well, which I also adored. And then you have the fitness aspects. So there's a lot of that going on here, the CrossFit and the training and all of that stuff, which I found fascinating as well. This had really what I'm looking for anytime I pick up a contemporary like this. There were so many amazing character dynamics developing relationships. You had those individual character interactions so you got to learn about them. You learned about their past, learned about their present, what they've gone through, what they're going through, how they're helping each other. And I really love that. And of course, I loved seeing all of the puppies. There were some difficult moments in here, I will say, because of course you do hear about a puppy mill, you hear about abuse and neglect of dogs and things that are being done to save them. And the rescue is threatened at one point by the owner of that puppy mill and she goes to some very dangerous lengths to kind of get back at Sunny for shutting down her puppy mill. So you have to go into this knowing that but for the most part if I can handle this book and make it through unscathed anybody can because let me tell you I purposefully avoid books that have any kind of dog death whatsoever I just cannot handle it it is my one trigger but this was okay like this was beautiful I thought this was so so sweet and well done I think I'm gonna settle on a 4.5 stars it was definitely not quite the five star tier but I think four stars is a little bit too low just because I do think about this occasionally it just was so heartwarming and sweet and it was everything that I was looking for in adult romantic contemporary and I don't think I can give it anything less than a 4.5. This came in and it kind of blew me away. I wasn't expecting it. Like I said, this is the very first book that I read from that book drop subscription. And so I'm very, very grateful that I love this so much. And it put a new author on my radar and a book on my radar that I might not normally pick up. So again, highly recommend. I will definitely be watching out for more releases from Alicia Whistler in the future. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are the five books that I have completed and or DNF'd. And that is all that I have for you today. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I discussed today and what your thoughts were. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. I post content on Tuesdays, sometimes Saturdays, and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos.